Um, can you talk about um, the concept and the journey of actually creating Power Lens, um, especially on an international scale? Yeah, so I feel like the beginning of this film really has like multiple starting points. Um, it kind of started when uh, one of our producers, Ava and Jordan, teamed up to make a short in Colombia. It also kind of started when uh, my producer, Jordan, and I met for the first time in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is my home, at a really fantastic vegan Thai restaurant called Fred Curry that you should definitely go to if you're ever in town. Um, and those two hours literally changed my life because uh, I met one of my best friends and made this film. Um, but we were talking, Jordan could just come back from Colombia. We were talking about the differences and the similarities between Colombia and Black Mesa, which is my home. Um, everyone in Black Mesa, that's my friends, my family, wants even an ex. Like, it's, that's where my community, and we were talking about, um, and it's easier to list the differences, which are the language and the monkeys. And that everything else is the same between like how we wear our clothing, what type of food we eat, even which corporation is affecting both communities. And that's really where the beginning of that film turned into this larger thing. We just kind of followed those same corporations around. And this is happening everywhere. Everywhere I go, I hear about some form of extraction that is happening. So this is just looking at five communities uh, with a lot of accountability in the process to make sure that they actively wanted to participate. A full-bodied, enthusiastic yes was given by every single member. Um, all the way up until the screening of the film that was very important to not be a part of the extractive culture around uh, media and Native people. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so are you saying that, um, is that how you selected the indigenous communities is by basically following like what you were doing from Black Mesa and just kind of going that way or was it like... I mean it was definitely also like a global, like we were looking at the corporations um, truthfully, like Standing Rock um, was found because a friend of mine, Rose Stiffart, who actually also worked with Tracy Rector, um, on very, who was the, one of the directors of the film before, um, we met through her. Uh, she was one of the first people out at Standing Rock, and so I found out, I think the Native world knew about Standing Rock like months before the rest of the world did. Um, so like, that's how we found out about Standing Rock. Um, and then yes, sometimes it was through London Money Network or Frontline Defenders or various community members like pointing us in certain directions. Really just being open to asking the question like, where should we go? Who wants us here? And who wants to participate? Yeah, um, especially with those indigenous communities, um, like going there, interviewing all these people, did you find that like your community stories was similar to the, similar to theirs to the point that you guys were exchanging like sharing knowledge uh, between each other as the filming went for each community? Oh yeah, for sure, definitely. It was cool to see what methods are being used that are in the same. But I think my favorite were those little moments of like humanity, like in Oaxaca when you see those two girls like whispering to each other while drinking juice, like. Everyone's had that moment, and when telling this, I think a lot of it is about the extract, like extractive culture that we have around energy. But a lot of it is also just look at what people are, and look at you know it's just kind of like an introspective on people, um, and I think that's really what it is. Yeah. Was. Yeah. No, absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent. And seeing a film like this. Um, from an indigenous perspective is really great because you know there's a lot of documentaries from the non-native perspective throughout um, throughout the years so for you when you came into it how important was for you to make sure that it came from your perspective but not only from your perspective but from their own voices with each community yeah so i mean it's super important that was one thing that we definitely like when I say like we were getting like a full body, and that's how consent should be, just FYI, <laughs> full enthusiastic yes. And that's what we were getting from every person. Um, in a lot of ways, so I grew, I started out with Audio Backlit Media, mm -hmm. um, where we were teaching kids how to make film. And so even in these communities, oftentimes if a kid was coming up and like looking at the camera, I'd teach them really quickly how to use it and let them run around with it and like shoot and do different things. So in a lot of ways, because, okay, fun fact, I, Bye. <laughs> so camera viewfinders, you can actually adjust to be your prescription. And so I shoot without my glasses on and I shoot with the camera being my eyeballs. So 
when, when I'm shooting, what you're seeing is literally what I'm seeing. And that's also how I teach my kids, I call them all my kids, to film, is um, to like let us look into your perspective. Because I think that's what filmmaking is, is trying to understand what somebody else's life is and how they see the world. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a lot of like, this is genuinely how I see communities. This is how I see it. And being an indigenous person, so oftentimes people would show up at Manelli's house, which uh, that means grandmother in Navajo. Um, and like, they would just be like, look at this outhouse and like, look at this dog. And like, they would just show, like, not necessarily the ugliness, but just the things that were foreign to them, as opposed to the things that I find beautiful and common and completely normal for my life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to see from a community. Absolutely, it's amazing. And just seeing now your body for <laughs> Because uh, I met her when she was actually 14 years old on her first short film in the footsteps of a yellow woman, so you should check that out as well. I think it's online, right? Yeah, it's on yeah. YouTube. It, yeah, it, it's not <laughs> too great. The storyline is really good. It just it was a little rough. Please forgive me. <laughs> um, it was really inspiring to look there and see the younger generations coming in and you know fighting it back about the displacement and like, talking about the elders and all that. Um, when you were creating this, I mean, this film is itself a resistance movement as well. Um, what do you find to be the most valuable tool for younger generations who want to continue being part of this movement of resistance? Oh, I have no idea. I think all of them are super vital. This is what I tell people all the time. I'm like, we are working against this like huge monolith of like corporations and governments that are really trying to not necessarily help us get out of this like totally fucked environmental situation we're in. Um, and so, but every single part of it's necessary. If you want to go to school and get into politics, do it because we need people in politics. If you want to do frontline work, if you want to be out there like protesting and doing direct action, do it because we need people doing that. If all you want to do is carry a clean pair of dry socks and some hand warmers to be able to give our houseless brothers and sisters on the street a chance at a better night, do it because that builds community and all of those things are so important to getting through to the other side of this climate crisis. Yeah. Um, and your film highlights like some of the damage and tragedy in course inflicted on Native peoples and their lands, um, but there are also some victories that you highlighted. Um, what do you consider the most valuable takeaway from the most recent successful fights? Just don't give up, I guess. Um, I will say, like, the Black Mesa one from my home, we highlighted a little bit more positively than what is actually currently happening. Um, so what happened was in 2017, Peabody Coal filed for bankruptcy. Um, so they, like, shut down. Um, and so because they filed for bankruptcy, they're allowed to mine pre-mined coal for 20 years. So they'll technically be out of the land in 2037. And so what they did right before the end of 2017 was blow up a whole bunch of the coal seam, and they're just like pulling it out. But they also don't have to pay taxes on it because it's for, there's like some weird clause with bankruptcy. They also like fired all the local people and went down to the commendable crew. Also, uh, mining corporations are not required to clean up after themselves. So that big green pipe that is like literally massive and gigantic will be there until it goes away on its own, um, unless we hold corporations accountable and make them clean up after themselves, which is actually a big fight that's happening in Colombia right now. And Colombia did just win a lawsuit in their favor, so we might see some change. That's awesome. Okay, round of applause for that. <laughs> Something good. <laughs> um, this this film has like so many aspects in it that I think is a really great educational tool. Are you guys planning, or does it already have an educational curriculum to put in schools for teachers to use and to talk? Yeah, we are on Good Docs as our educational distributor. We also have like um, a packet like. 30 questions or stuff to like teach through. We've gone through and taught at middle school and high schools and colleges around not just this country, but also like in England and in Canada and Colombia and hopefully soon present Mexico. So we're trying to 
get it out. We're also starting to work with um, potentially. I mean, this is like it's so hard and complicated sometimes with these things because it like moves so fast and so slow. But maybe with Greenpeace and Amnesty International to get it into like a European. Um, countries where they're not necessarily talking about indigeneity and sustainability together and using this as a way to begin that conversation. That's great. Um, if anybody has a question, uh, there's a mic back there. You can stand up and ask the question if you'd like. CJ there, who's waving his hand. There you go. You know, these lights really remind me about how dirty my glasses are. <laughs> so <laughs> I really can't see any funny just to end up. Hi. Um, so you know there's been a change of government in Colombia. And uh, for many, many years, the indigenous people there were considered to be uh, some kind of ultra left wing terrorist groups. And how did they, you know, how could they survive? I mean, why did the people even allow them to be there? This film does hint a little bit at, you know, once you're being shot and your only recourse is to be killed in order to get what you want, passively to be killed, a certain group of people will not accept that. But what's really important here, and it isn't in the film, is that mysterious force somehow behind the scenes that changed that government in Colombia. And now they have a different government, which when I read about it, was brought about largely by the people in this film. They somehow did something there, which we haven't been told about, to get a government that would listen to them. That's what I don't, you know, that's the mysterious force in this, in this film. It's, all of a sudden, Peabody Coal goes out of business. Why? Why did they go out of business? Why, why do these things happen? What do people really do to get change within their society? Yeah, so, I mean, it varies from place to place. In the Philippines, a lot of it actually has to do with NPA. Like, they really did a huge force. And so actually in 2020, when Duarte came to office in the Philippines, um, we almost took the Philippine section out of the film because, well, and this is partially about like the consent and accountability, is we almost took it out without asking the people of the Philippines. And then we were like, wait, 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 we need to talk to the people in this film. What do they want us to do? And we got back probably the most terrifying response I could have ever heard, which was, um, please keep us in. It's harder for them to make us disappear if people know who we are. So that's, uh, but that was literally like NPA did a lot for in the Philippines. Um, and in Colombia, it's been some, one of the groups that we worked with, London Mining Network, they've been doing a lot of advocacy, especially in other places. That's why it's so important for you to do work here in your own backyard. Um, oftentimes people see this film and they're like, I want to go to the Philippines, I want to go to Colombia, I want to go to Baca Mesa because they need support and help. But you have so much power, one, not only being in the freaking capital, but two, like, as a place that is consuming energy, you have so much power as the consumer to hold those corporations accountable. So it was actually a bunch of um, like actions that happened in the UK that helped change Colombia's government and like helped do like put these things into places. So actions happening all over the world can be a lot more powerful than like just on the res where there's no cameras and nothing really watching us, you know. Um, and so a lot of it is like collective group, and then, yeah, so that's how a lot of, and then like Black Mesa Peabody went under because they were bad at managing their money. <laughs> no one really did anything on that one. We tried really, really hard for a long time. Uh, and I think the best thing about Black Mesa is that we succeeded in the fact that we're still there, because it's been, a resistance has been happening for 60, 70 years, including like my entire family. Um, and we're all still there, we still speak the language, we still wear, like, this is called a sunny scarf. Uh, like, I'm wearing my protection beads, and like, the fact that we still have that representation uh, is really crucial. And just fun facts, two fun facts. So, there's this word in Navajo called ke, and it means relationships. And ke is vital to everything in our culture. It creates all of our bonds. So, y'all being here today, we're building ke, 
which means you're part of my family. So welcome to my family. <laughs> and as being part of my family, um, so this museum actually holds some significance. So Danny Blacko, who was in the film, um, is one of my uncles. He recently passed away. But his mother was actually a wheat pasting in this museum for like 15 years. And it is taken down at this point, but so we just kind of brought mother and son here today. So thank you all for being part of that. Full <laughs> circle. <laughs> Next question. Well, so so much to say. Uh, I'm Eduardo Muscala and came from Mexico. I'm an environmental attorney. You know some of these uh, cases very close. Uh, another big news is that uh, the case in, in, in Oaxaca was won by, by, by the communities uh, because of the European mechanism for, for uh, human rights and business. Uh, it was a French company and they just uh, won a few months ago. And so many things to say. Um, and finally, this guy made me cry a little because uh, it seems like, yeah, it's, it's really like some force behind all of this because I am here. Because I, I, I am here not for tourism, I came because uh, I'm working with uh, also uh, communities and NGOs from all over the world who are facing not the power, but the steel industry. In the, steel industry. the mines and the steel. Uh, Companies in Brazil, in Liberia, in South Africa, in Mexico, that are using almost the same, well, it's not, a, not almost, the, the same politics in order to, 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 to try to, 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 to have all the gains and destroy all, all the life. So, thank you. I will, I will try to, uh, to keep in touch with you because I, I, I want to know more about this experience. If this, uh, documents all have any impact on, on on the companies in the view of the of the, of, the, of, of, of these kind of cases. If you uh, 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 take these cases because they are already like connected or you connected, because we are working right now connected. Because, for example, in Mexico, these mining companies were one of the most bigger of the biggest one of the world, like also Media Latinum are using the cartels to kidnap, murder the, the environmental defenders. So I came here because I have some meeting with allies and with the, in the American Commission on Human Rights, so I would love to, to, to know more about this pro process and, and, and impacts that you saw. Thank you so much. Yeah, reach out. You can reach out through our website, powerlands.org. Go straight to my producer. I'm better email. Um, reach out, I'd love to be in touch about that. Hi, uh, my name is Holly. Thank you so much for this beautiful film. It's really amazing to see documentaries like this and to see indigenous filmmakers like yourself supporting the sharing of indigenous stories. Uh, so really thank you and congratulations on this beautiful work. Um, so I work with an association that supports indigenous peoples around the world who are defending their territories of life. So I actually know some of the communities in this film. It was really quite powerful to see them here. Uh, including the ones from Mindanao. Um, a lot of filmmakers, it seems, doing documentaries, think of the advocacy piece as an afterthought, and they maybe connect with NGOs and activists through the filmmaking process, but think about the impact only after the film has made, has been made. It seems like you really incorporated that very clearly into the filmmaking process, working with frontline defenders, obviously working with the communities and the movements in which they're grounded. So I'm just wondering if you can tell us a bit more about that process and that decision to incorporate that so clearly into the actual creative process and the filmmaking process. And if you see any difference in how the film is being received and potentially the impact it's having as a result of those kind of networks of advocacy being kind of baked into the film itself. Thanks. Man, I really wish I was conscious of doing that. Because um, <laughs> you made it sound really cool. Um, no, so I grew up in Black Mesa. This is, I grew up 
Uh, I went to my first protest at like three weeks in utero. Um, yeah, my parents met because of the land resistance. Like that's where I come from. My great great grandmother was on the mini, like literally my last name, Mini Beats, was because of the Mini Beats lawsuit. Um, so yeah, I was born and raised in activism. I have so a lot of that stuff, like I just didn't know that I was doing because that's how I was raised to do it. If you're gonna look into resistance, it should be in solidarity. I think also a lot of that has to deal with the way that people, I think indigenous people should be telling indigenous stories because this is what we're gonna come out with as opposed to like some like poverty porn BS. Um, so yeah, so I think that's, that's it for me is, I don't know, just tell your own stories. I really want to know, if every single person in here made a documentary about their life, I would sit down and watch it because it would be super fascinating. So I think that you should tell your own stories however you want to do that. And I am really thankful for every single person who helped me and allowed me to tell parts of their stories. But like I said, like they saw cuts of it along with us. They were giving notes, they were, because yeah, so many people have come into my life and taken things and put them out there in ways that are not true to what we want. And I think we also kind of put a positive spin on it because like, you can't be doing 60, 70 plus years of resistance, if not several hundred years of resistance, without being hopeful that there is a better option. Good afternoon. I really enjoyed the film and um, it was really inspiring and uh, emotional for me. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, uh, it's not, I feel like it's not common in environmental documentaries to see um, positive depictions of Global South armed communist and socialist organizations and movements, especially in the United States. And so I'm wondering, uh, were, was there any, one, was there any hesitation around including uh, that very intimate depiction of the NPA um, in your film? Uh, which I loved, and two, um, were you concerned about how like U.S. American audiences might perceive it? Yeah, I definitely think in protest terms and resistant terms, like people always talk about the peaceful protest, and like yes, peaceful protest is very very powerful. But at what point is it more violent to allow yourselves to constantly be shot down? Um, and so that's what we were trying to depict: is that there is always another option. Um, and it's not saying that one is better than the other because both are powerful in their own right. But yeah, it's just, it, for us, it was the question, like, what is more violent to arm and protect yourself or to just stand there and allow yourself and your community to be wiped off? All right, last question. Uh, hello, uh, I love the film, really enjoyable, I love uh, movies about like small communities and also anti-capitalist ones, you know, it's great. Uh, so on that note, one of the parts where it was funny in a sad way was when uh, one of the representatives of these corporations, you know, said like, oh, we should have a workshop about uh, the good things that we do. So I guess my question was, uh, you know, what are the ways uh, that you've seen through your career in which these like corporations sort of like spin the narrative to make themselves be like the good guy or kind of like to quiet down the voices of, you know, these affected communities that, you know, no corporation at that level is not affecting anyone. So like how are ways that they spin a narrative and I guess what can we do as like population to kind of like not be swayed by that? Um, just assume that they're always spinning something. That's the best way to not be swayed. <laughs> they're always out to get you. <laughs> But one of the best examples is actually wind power in Oaxaca. A lot of those wind farms are owned by Bimbo, Wonder Bread, and Arrowhead Water. And these companies are then being like, look at how green we are. Look at how much good we're bringing green energy into these communities, even though they're, they're literally polluting places. Steel is 8% of our carbon emission. Uh, and then they're also like, be, like forcing people off of their land literally like having cartels take them out. Latina was one person who that happened to. She's amazing, by the way. She does do tours every once in a while. If you see her name, go. She's incredible. Uh, but so, the, so yeah, so that's it. It's like, it's literally these companies where they're like, we're so green, we're so amazing. Anytime a company is telling you that they're amazing, they're usually not. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll never really be free until capitalism falls. It's like the main truth behind it because sustainability is not gonna be super possible as long as there's a financial uh, 
end to it. And again, wind power is another great example. The inventor of the wind turbine wanted every house and building to have a small wind turbine and a small solar panel. The problem with that model is you can't charge people for energy if they already have the energy. And that's where we get these large wind farms that are not sustainable. Um, and so like, those are the things that we should be advocating for, is not what is the financial and profit source behind it. If there is a profit behind it, it is most likely corrupt. Well, I wanted to thank you for being here and letting us show your incredible film and all of you for being here. Um, please check our website and for future programs, but a round of applause for this wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.